Thanks for giving, amen. Thanks for giving, amen. All right. <clears throat> So as Mike is so graciously putting our quarters in the quarter tube, I invite you to stand as you are able for the Spirit Song, page Scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 15 through 17 and 21 and 22. As the people were filling with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, John the Baptist, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water. But one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandal. <coughs> he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. <coughs> his winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, 
May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Can you imagine being too famous? Comedian Bill Burry, who became famous for his roles in the movies like Ghostbusters and Caddyshack, says this. Nothing can prepare you for being famous. It's completely different from the way anybody's parents raised them. You think it will be a life of leisure, and there are moments of riding in limos and having somebody carry your bag, but it's also a 24 hour a day job. To people who want to be rich and famous, I'd say get rich first and see if that doesn't cover it. <laughs> So John the Baptist was famous. He was a famous preacher, just like Billy Graham or the Pope. And he didn't mind the attention that came with the job. He was preaching in the wilderness, so it would have been like the old-time tent meetings. And people were coming from everywhere to hear him. And he was telling them to repent and to get right with God. And they were responding by the thousands. So far, so good. But the problem wasn't that he was famous. It was that he was too famous. People were saying, wow, this he must be the Messiah. But John was not the Messiah. He was only called to get people ready for the Messiah. And so John said, no, you've got it all wrong. I am not the Messiah, not even close. Let me explain the difference to you. The one who is coming is so great that I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. I just baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In other words, you ain't seen nothing yet. The one who is coming is not only greater, he's altogether different. I'm like a flashlight, he's like the 4th of July. I am just pointing to the way. He is the way. So after that story, we have Luke's account of Jesus' baptism. And he tells us that heaven was opened up and the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. Now note that the spirit and the voice didn't come during Jesus' baptism, but afterwards, when Jesus was praying. Prayer was so important to Jesus. Luke tells about Jesus praying a lot, but only a few times does he tell us what he prayed about. We know that he prayed for his disciples. And just before his death, he prayed that if the Father were willing, this cup might pass from him. In other words, he prayed that he might escape death, but only if the Father was willing. And he ended his prayer by saying, not my will, but yours be done. He even prayed for his enemies. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And as he died, he prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But we don't know what he prayed after his baptism. Now we could think of Jesus' baptism as his calling into ministry. So maybe he was praying to be prepared for this great task that was before him. Or maybe he was praying for vision to lead in the right way. Or for strength to withstand temptation. Or for disciples who would be faithful. But whatever he prayed, 
It was during his prayer that heaven opened and he received his blessing from God. So that's important for us to notice. Sometimes we fail to appreciate the power of prayer. Sometimes when we're faced with a difficult problem, we say, well, all we can do now is pray. As if after all hope has been exhausted, the only thing left is to just pray. But we'd be, do better if we said, <clears throat> well, we can pray. Knowing that in prayer, we connect ourselves to God, to God's power, to possibilities beyond our imagining. Every day, God answers prayers in amazing ways. Every day, God blesses people who have taken the time to pray. Now, that doesn't mean that God answers every prayer as we ask. But it does mean that prayer is a great power, not just a last resort. But I think it's interesting to ask why Jesus prayed. After all, didn't he come from heaven? Wasn't he always connected to God? Yes, I believe Jesus was always connected in some way to God. But his prayer life shows us that he considered prayer to be something more than just handing God a wish list. When he prayed, it wasn't like he was a college student riding home for money. He was a son coming home to visit, to sit down and talk, to continue an important relationship, to gain strength, to keep on the right path. Haven't you experienced a relationship like that at some point in your life? It might have been with your mother instead of your father, or your husband or wife, or a trusted friend. But the point is that you could talk to that person and come away strengthened, come away with a clearer direction. You didn't have to worry about them leading you astray. You never felt judged by them. You knew you could rely on them and trust them. And I think Jesus had a relationship like that with his Heavenly Father. And it helped him to do the right thing. Now we often talk about Jesus being without Sin, as if that were an easy thing for him. But I don't think that it was. If his sinlessness were easy, he wouldn't have been tempted like we're tempted. Because our temptations are not easy. The scriptures tell us that Jesus was indeed tempted like we are. So I think that his ability to stay true depended, at least in part, on his strong prayer life. So if prayer was important to Jesus, if prayer was the source of his strength and direction, doesn't it make sense to believe that we need prayer for strength and direction as well? Some years ago, Barbara Brown Taylor, who is an an Episcopal priest and a wonderful author. She wrote an article where she told about her granddaughter Madeline's experience of the death of a friend and her parents' divorce. Now things came to a head on Madeline's birthday when it was time for her to blow out the candles. And her grandfather told her to make a wish and she didn't want to. She had already wished for her friend to live, and her friend died. And she wished for her parents to get back together, but she knew they wouldn't. So why bother? Nobody had much of an answer. I can just imagine how quiet it got around that birthday table. But it did get Barbara to thinking. 